the Microsoft PowerPoint? Yes, we see. Uh, yes, yes, we can see her. We can see a whole BPD. Do we see presentation mode now, full screen? Uh, not yet. No. Or do I have to switch to presenter mode? Yeah, yeah. I think like you have this? to. Uh, no, that didn't fix it. No, no, no. Uh, I think you have to present the slide and then go back to the uh, Google Chrome or uh, wherever Google Meet is and then present the presented part of the presentation. I don't, Wait, hold, I don't know if that's possible. Hold on. So I have the I have the window. You can see my PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Says, uh, but we can also see your slide, like one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. Uh, so then if I go full screen, um, you don't see it full screen, do you? No. no. Uh, Noah, have you shared a particular window or your entire screen? No, I shared this particular window. Should I do my entire screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I, you should uh, stop presenting. Then okay, uh, begin sure. again and present your entire screen. And then go to presentation mode. Yeah. Okay, so you see it again, right? And then uh, now I will try it. And I'm sorry for the technical hiccup here. Okay, you see it? Does that work? Uh, no, we see your slide, but it didn't go to full screen. Um, <clears throat> I'll try one more time, and then if it doesn't work, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, I'll click through them like this, and I apologize. They should still be pretty visible. Sure. You have to present your entire screen. Yes, I will do that. I thought I did that. Uh, Okay, just one moment. So you see PowerPoint now. And then uh, I will go full screen. Does that work? Yes, it's working now. Yes, you're okay. the full. Sorry, I, uh, I'm much more used to Zoom, uh, but, but this works just fine. So thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you uh, to the, the Optica chapter at uh, IISER um, for inviting me. Um, I, I imagine that this invitation has something to do with a personal connection that I developed with Priyanuj this past summer. And uh, it's great to see that he's back in India um, and enjoying a new school year. So today uh, I'm going to talk to you about a topic uh, broadly called Metasurface Polarization Optics. And uh, that's a very broad title, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, I'm going to talk about these uh, novel types of optics called Metasurfaces and uh, applications in, in creating new types of polarization optical elements that would be difficult to realize by other means. So before I begin, uh, you might ask the question, as I often do to myself, uh, what is a metasurface? There's actually not necessarily an answer to that question. Um, broadly speaking, a metasurface could be applied to a wide variety of different things. So uh, I put just some examples here, such as gold antennas for you know, operating in the mid-IR, dielectric pillar type uh, uh, phase shifters for visible and near-IR wavelengths, even freeform devices, um, in this case in the near-IR. But you'll even see the term applied to engineered structures in the, at radio frequencies or in the microwaves. So uh, in summary, any engineered optical surface might be dubbed a metasurface, but a definition that will work for us today is that a metasurface is a, a device in which uh, engineered elements are separated at a sub-wavelength pitch um, and that's intended to enact some behavior either in transmission or reflection. Still a very broad definition, but getting a bit more specific. And the, the, the enticing part of this field of metasurface, metasurfaces is that the, the elements, the engineered elements, sometimes people call them meta-atoms, can be designed at will and fabricated with completely standard semiconductor fabrication uh, technologies. Uh, sometimes people say that the term metasurface comes from the term metamaterial and that it's a two-dimensional version of uh, metamaterials. However, 
I personally think that that is not correct, um, or maybe it is correct, but not fully. Uh, I think metasurfaces actually have much more in common with diffractive optics, which is maybe a bit less of a flashy term, but a more accurate one. And metasurfaces are in some sense the latest development in the field of diffractive optics. So uh, you might ask yourself, what is a metasurface good for? And the answer that many people have come up with is that metasurfaces are good for replacing bulk optical elements. And in some cases, that may be true. Uh, it is indeed possible to make, for instance, flat lenses and axicons and other optical elements using metasurfaces. Uh, however, at the end of the day, uh, we already knew what a lens was. Um, uh, we, we, I, have, I have two of them on my face. There's one in the camera imaging me and, sent and transmitting the image to you. Uh, can we do more than that? And uh, that is sort of the question uh, that is posed by a field that some people might call multifunctional metasurfaces, which is uh, asking the question, how do we make a metasurface and implement many functions in parallel that are accessed by different degrees of freedom of light? So you'll see several examples of this that people have done. There's wavelength sensitive optics, metasurface optics. There's metasurface optics that have different responses dependent on the incident angle of light. So that would be on the K vector. But in particular, what I focus on and what we're going to talk about today are metasurfaces that have multiple functions that can be accessed with the polarization degree of freedom of incident light. Uh, and so the optic elements that I'm going to uh, talk about today that are realized with metasurfaces do not really have an analog in bulk optics, at least not one that could be uh, uh, realized with just a single component. And that's what makes this exciting, I think. So I know uh, we have quite some polarization expertise at the at IISER uh, Kolkata. Uh, I, I know uh, 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 Priyanuj has spent some time working in a very well-known Mueller matrix polarimetry group. Uh, but I still think that it's worth taking one slide to review some of the basics of polarized light. You know, the, 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 the picture of it that you learn in high school is that uh, polarized light can be an ellipse um, in general. Uh, or a line or a circle. And that's sort of the uh, spirit of the Jones description of, of polarized light. However, uh, when we, we take a more sophisticated optics course when we're a university student, oftentimes we learn about the Stokes formalism, which is a, uh, a casting of polarized light description in terms of intensity quantities, in terms of energy, in terms of observables. So uh, there's a clear analog with quantum mechanics there. And this Stokes vector uh, describes light in its most general form as a uh, polarization four vector. Uh, and what this gets you above the Jones formalism is the ability to describe unpolarized light and partially polarized states of light. And uh, this description naturally uh, lends itself to this Poincaré sphere description, which is also very well known, where circularly polarized light lies at the poles, linearly polarized light is in the equator, and elliptically polarized light is at points in between. So something else I want to talk about as we're introducing this subject of metasurface polarization optics is the idea of holography. Holography is a uh, very old area of optics at this point. Um, in fact, it was the subject of the 1971 Nobel Prize in Physics, which was given to uh, Dennis Gabor, and, uh, who originally formulated hol holography for electron beams. Um, but it works, it, 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 it had its moment in optics after the invention of the laser in the 1960s and throughout the 1970s. So the idea behind holography being that you can record uh, the, the light field produced by an object in a photographic fit film. But, but one of the more powerful uh, ideas to come out of holography uh, 50 years ago was the idea of a computer-generated hologram. And uh, uh, the idea behind computer-generated holography, as posed in the 1960s, uh, is that a hologram need not be something that's recorded from a real object. Uh, we can engineer the light. We can engineer a field by engineering an object. Uh, in this case, a transparency with holes uh, that whose size would dictate the amplitude and whose uh, lateral position would dictate the the phase through a detour phase effect. Um, uh, uh, we can engineer a hologram uh, without having access to any object. And to me, this is the beginning of diffractive optics and uh, ultimately the antecedents of metasurfaces. Uh, however. Uh, all of this work on holography and computer-generated holography, by and large, was specified without reference to light's polarization state. Um, and that is a very obvious omission, because polarization is one of the most fundamental characteristics of light, after all. 
What I want to say, though, is that that, that that fact was not lost on people in the 1960s. They appreciated that they, what they were doing was not complete in a sense because it was only dealing with the scalar nature of, li uh, of, lights, uh, of light. So uh, I put this quote here from a 1965 paper from Lohmann himself, who's one of the pioneers of computer-generated holography, saying that a hologram isn't really what it purports to be because it doesn't take into account polarization. And there were a number of proposals, uh, even back in the 1960s, of how this would be modified, uh, how we would modify holography with a number of polarization type tricks to, to have it carry some information about what the polarization state would be during the recording phase. But what was, what was really limiting the people back then is that they did not have a medium. They did not have a, 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 a medium to make these holograms that was polarization sensitive. And that is something that has changed in the last 50 years. In fact, there are many media that have been shown uh, in the literature uh, under many different names and sometimes with different mathematical treatments that are polarization sensitive computer generated holograms. And I'm not going to dwell on most of these other technologies today because this is about metasurfaces, which I believe are the most powerful such technology that has been demonstrated. But I put this here because there is a rich history and um, I, I, we have a review article that will be published in about a month's time discussing this history and, um, and trying to unify this past research over the past 50 or so years. Uh, but that brings us to metasurfaces. What is a metasurface? You could say a metasurface is a polarization sensitive computer generated hologram, or that's one thing that a metasurface could be. And uh, one particular implementation that gets us that, of course, it's not the only one, it, are metasurfaces that are comprised of uh, arrays of dielectric pillar-like elements. And these dielectric pillar-like elements can be asymmetric in a way that can be specified by the designer. And in so doing, we create uh, a polarization-dependent transformation that can vary arbitrarily with space. So if we look at this sort of cartoon of a metasurface device, what, what it really is is it's an array of wave plates. It's an array of wave plates in which the overall phase, the retardance, and the fast axis orientation of the wave plates can be changed at will from point to point. That would be something that would be, uh, I don't want to say impossible, but perhaps extremely difficult to make using bulk uh, birefringent crystals, like a normal wave plate is made out of, because the crystalline axis is fixed, and you would have to uh, manipulate the phase in a, a spatially uh, resolvable way. So rather straightforwardly with these metasurfaces, we can implement a spatially varying Jones matrix uh, that in which, the, uh, in which we have two characteristic phase shifts for eigenpolarization states, which have to be linear, and we can rotate the element by an overall, uh, an overall angle to control the orientation of its fast axis. So the first important point here is that a metasurface is a spatially varying Jones matrix. And in, in fact, it is a spatially varying Jones matrix that has a particular form, and that form can be controlled by the design of the metasurface elements. So the next thing to realize is that once we have a spatially varying Jones matrix, how do we design things with it? Well, in, in scalar diffractive optics, in scalar holography, uh, we have Fourier optics, which uh, is one of the most influential viewpoints that has come to optics uh, uh, in the last century, I would say. Um, which is that we can understand optical propagation through the lens of linear systems theory. We, we all learn this in school. Uh, and uh, when, we, when we do that, if we have a lit, an electric field, which I might call U, if we want to know how that electric field uh, will propagate uh, further on in space, by taking its Fourier transform, we can end up with an angular spectrum of plane waves. And we can treat each of those plane waves as a plane wave because we know exactly how plane waves propagate. We propagate things forward in time and space and then inverse Fourier transform, and we've propagated our field. Very powerful uh, way, of, a way of seeing things. If we have an element that is described by a spatially varying Jones matrix, such as a metasurface or one of the many other technologies I mentioned, or for now just a mathematical abstraction, uh, and we assume for a moment that this is illuminated by a plane wave. It doesn't have to be illuminated by a plane wave. It could be illuminated by some more complicated field, and that could be generalized, but just for simplicity, assume that it's illuminated by a plane wave. Then the Jones matrix will act on it everywhere to create some spatially varying electric field, which could be propagated um, individually for each of the orthogonal components of the Jones vector in, in accordance with uh, scalar Fourier optics. But there's another way of looking at it that at first seems like a mathematical bookkeeping trick, 
but uh, when you think a little bit more about it, it becomes somewhat deep. Um, if, we, if we say that there's a polarized plane wave illuminating this Jones matrix, spatially varying Jones matrix, which I show here, and we for a moment do not specify what its polarization state is. We just say uh, that it will be illuminated by some polarization state. If we instead apply the 4A operator to the Jones matrix itself, element-wise, we end up with four plane wave spectrums. Uh, in fact, we end up with a plane wave spectrum Jones matrix. Uh, and in so doing, uh, we specify the polarization behavior of the far field. So this A matrix, which is the Fourier uh, uh, transform of, of, of the spatially varying Jones matrix, gives the uh, polarization properties of the plane wave spectrum. And this gives a, uh, a, a way of looking at things that we dub Jones matrix 4A optics. So one way of looking at a metasurface or one of these other polarization transforming devices is as a computer generated hologram in which the far field uh, can have a plane wave spectrum that can be polarization sensitive in a designer specified way. Uh, and so uh, if you have this Jones matrix uh, hologram, we Fourier transform it, then we have some far field uh, Jones matrix uh, plane wave spectrum. And then as soon as we then say after the fact what the incident polarization state is, we can compute what the response of the entire far field is. So this is a way of looking at polarization sensitive optics independent of what the incident polarization state is. And as we go through this talk, I'm going to give you two big application areas that we have demonstrated uh, where I think that this can uh, enable new types of optics that could potentially be useful. So uh, the first use case is in going, will be considering uh, polarization sensitive elements, metasurfaces, where this spatially varying Jones matrix is periodic in nature. In other words, polarization sensitive diffraction gratings. And in particular, polarization diff sensitive diffraction gratings whose diffraction orders act as polarization analyzers, analyzing many polarization states in parallel with a single optical element. So uh, to make that a bit more tangible, I've, I'm jumping immediately into a specific example. So uh, here what you see is a drawing of a single unit cell of a repeating, uh, a repeating unit diffraction grating. And inside of the unit cell of the diffraction grating are these polarization sensitive metasurface elements. This is a design uh, that is intended to be used uh, with TiO2 uh, metas metasurface structures uh, for operation at 532 nanometers. Here's just a, a drawing of the design and here's a scanning electron micrograph of the design. And what this grating is designed to do is that when light illuminates it, in this case from uh, coming from a direction that's behind your screen, uh, it will split primarily into four diffraction orders, the inner four diffraction orders, and the light will distribute amongst those diffraction orders in accordance with the projection of the incident polarization state into the polarization state defined by these diffraction orders drawn in green ellipses. So uh, this set of four polarization states, sorry, is, is special because this corresponds to a tetrahedron inscribed in the Poincaré sphere, which is a set of four maximally different polarization states. You would want to choose four maximally different polarization states to maximize the fidelity of a measurement of what the polarization state is that illuminates the grating. So uh, by putting photo detectors on these four diffraction orders, we can immediately say what the polarization state of the light illuminating the grating was, and we can do it in an optimal way. Uh, so these gratings, if we make them without much effort, uh, we actually can get uh, diffraction orders that act as polarizers for these polarization states um, uh, with, with uh, what's a diattenuation or a polarization sensitive contrast. That's the normalized difference between the uh, intensity for the, the, that evokes the maximum uh, intensity response and the polarization that evokes the minimum intensity response, sort of a normalized contrast. Um, and uh, in a system with no absorptive polarizers. And um, unlike uh, traditional, uh, say, wire grid polarizers, we, we are able to keep over 50% of the light uh, in these four orders on average uh, over all polarization states. So uh, basically, uh, we can use this grading as a parallel analyzer of polarization. More tangibly, if we put one of these gratings in front of an imaging system and limit the field of view of the imaging system, then we can form four different images on a sensor of a scene, a distant scene. 
And by analyzing those four, uh, those four pictures pixel-wise, we can pull out what the Stokes vector is over the field of view. Um, uh, uh, and, and then we can say what the Stokes vector of the light is. In other words, using one of these gratings, we can make an imaging polarimeter that only has, uh, that, that is as simple as a normal imaging system, a normal camera, with the addition of a single uh, added component. Um, that's, of course, subject to some limitations. And in some upcoming work, uh, we're going to show that these gratings can adapt almost any imaging, uh, imaging system. But in our initial work, which is already uh, published two years ago, uh, we showed very simply that putting one of these gratings in front of an A-sphere could make a very simple polarization camera. And we went so far as to make a, a workable prototype, um, and you'll see more examples of that in a moment, um, of an imaging polarimeter based on a metasurface that has no moving parts, uh, it has no traditional uh, polarization optics, it's potentially uh, highly scalable, and um, uh, it is uh, completely parallel in time and can obtain the full Stokes vector. So uh, getting a bit more uh, specific here, uh, the imaging system is just this one aspheric lens. Again, uh, this could work with a multi-element camera lens objective under certain constraints, but just for sake of demonstration, we showed it with a singlet lens. And uh, this is what the sample looks like. It's, it's surrounded by gold just to block stray light that doesn't make it through the sample. And in this 1.5 millimeter aperture, we have the uh, actual metasurface grading itself. It could be much larger than that uh, if you have the facilities to create uh, larger metasurface samples. And if we look on the sensor of such uh, a camera, you can see, uh, uh, basically, you can see that it forms four images over its field of view uh, that have been analyzed with respect to different polarization states. And if we co-register these images to each other and, and process them in parallel pixel-wise, we can pull out what the Stokes vector is at each point in the field of view, and we can uh, derive other quantities from it. So I'm going to show you a few examples of that. So uh, uh, in each column here is going to be an example of a different uh, thing that we're looking at, and uh, then we're going to look at it uh, in, very, in various different aspects. So for instance, in the top row, you see what the raw exposure would be that this uh, metasurface polarization camera would obtain. Then after processing, we can get the S0, which is the intensity part of the Stokes vector. So that's essentially what a monochrome uh, camera would see. We can get the azimuth angle, uh, which is the, the orientation of the polarization ellipse and the degree of polarization. So here, you're looking at a very almost trivial object, which is a wheel of polarizers where the, pol where the pass axes of the polarizers are oriented radially outwards. So, if I hadn't told you that, when you look at this intensity image, you wouldn't know uh, necessarily what that was. However, by looking at the DOP, which is very high relative to the background, and the azimuth, uh, which is circulating around from uh, negative 90 to 90, you see immediately that these are polarizers. And in fact, you could have seen that from the raw image because different parts of the sub-images are dark or bright depending on the characteristic polarization state of the analyzers including the bottom left, which is equally bright because this is a roughly a circular polarization analyzer. To make this a bit more, uh, a bit more real, uh, in the second example, we look at a soda bottle. So you're looking head on at a soda bottle here. This is the cap. Of course, if I, if I hadn't told you that and you were only looking at this intensity image, you might not really realize at first that that's a soda bottle. In fact, you might not know that it is a 3D object at all. However, by looking at the azimuth uh, of the polarization state, we can see that it circles around in this pinwheel-like fashion. And that's because Fresnel light that undergoes a Fresnel reflection, uh, unpolarized light that undergoes a specular Fresnel reflection, becomes partially polarized. And it becomes partially polarized in a direction uh, perpendicular to the plane of incidence. So in that way, uh, the azimuth of specularly reflected light off of smooth objects can tell you about their, their surface normals. Um, and in a more uh, arbitrary scenario, if I take a picture of my colleague Paul in this in this fashion, um, uh, we can we can see that that this is indeed a 3D object, a, a, a human being rather than just a photograph of a human being. Um, and uh, in some outdoor examples, uh, this is a picture of some grass and a, a walkway. And the bicycle is not relevant, but perhaps it gives you an idea of scale. And this was just after a rainstorm. 
So you can see that the wet parts of the asphalt have a very strong uh, polarization signature that's partially polarized per parallel to the ground. Uh, so that helps you identify, in, in fact, that there's actually additional asphalt in the back of the, the drawing, the back of the photograph. And then finally, uh, those of you who know this polarization imaging literature know that almost every paper has a picture of a car, which is almost laughable, but there's a reason for it because uh, the smooth man-made features on automobiles uh, have uh, highly polarized signatures, in particular the windshields, um, that, that give you an idea of their orientation. Another thing we did with this is to show examples where circular polarization crops up. Uh, one of those being that if you look at 3D movie glasses, I don't know if uh, that's not so popular anymore, but those have circular polarizers in them. Um, and then uh, uh, in this middle example, we've taken a piece of plastic that we, we laser cut. And in one example, I'm, I'm, I'm just holding it. And in another, I'm squeezing it. And when I squeeze it, uh, it becomes extremely uh, uh, stress birefringent. Uh, the stress birefringent is visualized uh, in, in, in terms of circular polarization. And uh, that, that tr also holds true for almost any injection molded part, such as this tape dispenser. So uh, this prototype, we even wrote software to do this in real time, um, uh, where you can look at this raw image, um, a, a, a monochrome intensity image, the azimuth image, and the degree of polarization all in real time. And uh, 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 we, we've gone all the way from the fundamental theory of how the metasurface works to uh, maybe even a usable product. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, you're looking down the street at Harvard University. Perhaps Priya Nuj rec recognizes this. It's just outside our lab. Uh, the frame rate is only so slow just because of uh, some, some, uh, my slow computer processor. It's not a fundamental limitation of the camera. But one thing to observe is that as cars drive by and go around this turn, um, they have a strong azimuth signature that changes color as the car turns. So that is telling you about the 3D orientation of the automobile. Um, you can see as this truck goes around the corner, there you go. Um, so uh, I want to compare this to uh, other techniques for polarimetry. You could, you, could, uh, you, could, you could break polarimetric techniques into a few broad categories. One would be called division of time, where you're acquiring the necessary measurements to determine the Stokes vector sequentially in time, either with a moving or electrically switchable component. Um, but uh, that has obvious drawbacks. Another would be division of amplitude, which essentially is what we're doing with the metasurface. But using other techniques, it would be very bulky um, and would require a lot of polarization optics. And yet another technique is uh, the division of focal plane technique, uh, which uh, you can buy today. Uh, there are sensors from, that Sony is manufacturing at scale that does this. But uh, uh, that has other drawbacks. In particular, it's usually only sensitive to linear polarization and it's using absorptive uh, filters. And I've heard anecdotally that uh, many people have had uh, issues getting accurate polarimetric results with these, with these cameras, although I don't have much experience myself. But with the metasurface, uh, we can implement the division of amplitude approach, except that we compact many of the optical components into a single surface. In particular, all of the beam uh, splitting uh, and the, ch the channel splitting and the polarization analysis can be handled by a single non-absorptive polarization element. And that's what I wanna leave you with uh, in this part. So uh, in the second part of the talk, which will be a little bit shorter, uh, I want to revisit uh, this idea of, uh, of, of, of Jones matrix Fourier optics. So I gave you this very general picture of what you could do with a polarization sensitive element like a metasurface, but then I immediately jumped into the use case of a grating. However, um, a grating is actually only a very specific case where we have periodicity. What about in general where we have aperiodic elements? we have no periodicity to the spatially varying Jones matrix. Well, in that case, we just have to return to the most general picture that I already told you. We have to consider a, an, a, an optical object with a spatially varying Jones matrix as uh, implementing a far field that is also described by a spatially varying Jones matrix. Um, uh, it is a polarization sensitive hologram in general. The grading is also a polarization sensitive hologram. But what can we, earn, what can we learn by uh, figuring out how to design and make these, uh, these more general polarization sensitive holograms. So uh, as I said, uh, these will have a far field that is given by the element-wise Fourier transform of the Jones matrix of the element. 
And the way you can think of it is that each viewing direction in the far field looking back at the element is implementing a designer specified polarization device. And this Jones matrix formalism um, is, uh, is, is implementing uh, a, a hierarchy of different viewpoints where this matrix approaches at the top. Um, so if you look through the literature of polarization sensitive metasurfaces, oh man, I have, it looks like I have my recording on here from an old, ignore this laser pointer, I apologize. Um, if you look through the literature of what people have done with these polarization sensitive metasurfaces in the past, um, uh, people uh, have only considered this in terms of scalars breaking the polarization field into X and Y, or they have considered it at the level of Jones, uh, Jones vectors. But in this approach, we're actually doing something more general. We're not saying at all what the polarization, uh, incident polarization state is. We're considering all of them at once by consistently working at the level of, uh, of Jones matrices. And what I'm about to show you is that uh, this generalizes a lot of past work and suggests some overlooked possibilities in the field of metasurfaces and new polarization sensitive optical elements in general. So uh, how do we design one of these? The first step, and I apologize again about this laser pointer, uh, the first step in designing one of these polarization sensitive metasurfaces is to say what you want the far field uh, Jones matrix to be. Um, uh, so you, you write this down in terms of a spatially varying Jones matrix. Then uh, you have to say, uh, th then you can inverse Fourier transform it, and that should ideally give you the near field Jones matrix of the element you want to create that would uh, ideally implement this far field Jones matrix transformation. However, um, uh, it may be that this Jones matrix is one that we can't implement. So, uh, uh, some of you who know more about polarization may know about this idea of a matrix polar decomposition. And that's the idea that any matrix, not just a Jones matrix, any matrix in general, can be broken into a unitary Jones matrix, which is lossless, uh, a phase-like Jones matrix, and a Hermitian Jones matrix. And any matrix can be written as the product of those two things. Uh, however, with the metasurface platform I told you about before, which is just a single layer of pillars, we can only implement Jones matrices that are, are unitary, but more specifically, uh, are also symmetric. They have linear polarizations as their eigen polarizations. So for a given desired far field behavior, when we find the Jones matrix that implements it, it may not be one that we can implement straightforwardly with a metasurface. Because uh, uh, we need to be able to make something that is symmetric and unitary everywhere. Um, so that these two problems can be handled separately. Symmetry just implies that uh, if, every, if this Jones matrix distribution is everywhere going to be symmetric, then it must be that the uh, desired far field behavior also is everywhere symmetric because the Fourier transform is essentially a sum. And when you add together symmetric matrices, you will preserve matrix symmetry. So as long as we limit ourselves to designing things that have symmetric far field behavior, we can implement, uh, we've already taken care of the symmetry constraint. As far as unitarity, this just means that we have to be able to implement, uh, uh, in general, a behavior that would require loss with a lossless optic. And this is a polarization sensitive uh, analog to a problem that has been known for a long time in diffractive optics and even in mathematics, which is that of the phase problem. How do you find a phase only hologram that can implement a function that would ordinarily require both amplitude and phase modulation? And a typical solution to this phase problem is known as iterative phase retrieval which is normally discussed uh, in a scalar context, uh, but we can generalize it to uh, polarization using this matrix, uh, uh, th this matrix polar decomposition. Because usually in this uh, iterative phase retrieval, which is often, uh, often described uh, with something known as the Gershberg-Saxon algorithm, you are constantly iteratively Fourier transforming back and forth between the near and the far fields and obtaining the amplitude and the phase of the fields and, and dropping either dro dropping the amplitude variation um, and, and, and making it uh, uniform or dropping the phase variation uh, and, and imposing your own um, uh, your, your, or, or dropping the amplitude profile and imposing your own amplitude profile. But we can do that on the level of matrices with this matrix polar decomposition. And uh, it was not uh, necessarily 
trivial to realize that at first, but the gershberg saxon algorithm generalizes to matrix, uh, matrix mathematics if you use the matrix polar decomposition rather than the scalar uh, polar decomposition. So uh, I've presented to you a design strategy by which we can make a metasurface uh, that implements some desired far field polarization behavior. And next I'm going to show you two things that you can do with that that are above and beyond what has been done before or what was understood to be possible before. Uh, the last thing I forgot to say is that once you do this iterative phase retrieval, the end product of it is a unitary and symmetric Jones matrix after some number of iterations that can be implemented with one of these single layer uh, pillar-like metasurfaces such as one made of titanium dioxide. So these two applications I'm about to tell you about uh, mirror the, the matrix polar decomposition in that one of them resembles Hermitian-like Jones matrix tr transformations that are amplitude modulating and one uh, mirrors unitary-like transformations that are primarily phase modulating. So in the first one, I want to uh, revisit the idea of a polarization switchable metasurface. So over the, over the past decade, um, what a lot of people have shown with these metasurface optics is that by structuring uh, the, the individual elements, like I told you, in a polarization sensitive way, we can make optical elements that switch their behavior on the basis of incident polarization state. Either perhaps they create an, uh, either perhaps they create a lens that, that has a focus depending on what the linear polarization incident on the lens is, or they create holograms in general that are able to switch um, depending on which of two orthogonal polarizations are illuminating the optical element. Uh, in fact, in our own work, we showed that uh, this generalizes to elliptical polarizations, including circular polarizations in general. But still, you're limited to one chosen basis of orthogonal polarization states. You can only have switching on the basis of two polarization states, one far field behavior for one and one far field behavior for the orthogonal one. Uh, however, by revisiting this formalism, uh, you will readily see that this is not fully general. So uh, we can actually make every pixel of the far field a, a polarization analyzer for a chosen polarization state so long as the polarization analyzer is symmetric, which, uh, and this is a bit technical, can be accomplished by assuring the output polarization state uh, is of flipped handedness relative to the input polarization state. So to give you just an example of this, with a metasurface, we can make, uh, we can make a hologram uh, in which the far field is a series of images of different polarization states, drawings of polarization state. And the pixels corresponding, uh, the, the, the plane waves that correspond to these drawings in the far field are themselves sensitive to the polarization states that they are drawings of. So when we illuminate the metasurface with these different polarization states, um, uh, the, depending on which parts of it are bright and dark, a human could look at this and interpret what the polarization state illuminating the grating was. And so we're switching on the basis of many polarization states. There's many far field responses, not just two for an orthogonal basis. Uh, so basically this type of hologram is a visual polarimeter where you can pick out the polarization state of the far field just by looking at it. So we can take that, that, uh, that idea of a visual polarimeter even, um, even farther. Um, and we can make a more sensitive far field hologram where not only are we projecting drawings of, uh, different polarization states. In fact, we're making a hologram that is a polar plot of the Poincaré sphere with the North Pole here and the South Pole here. And we can mix together features that are sensitive to polarization, like these polarization state drawings, with, polar, with features that actually have no polarization sensitivity, like these grid lines. Um, and uh, what you're seeing here is a movie of the far field response of the hologram as uh, we turn a linear polarizer in front of it. Uh, uh, we can do the same as we turn a, a quarter wave plate in front of it and uh, uh, we go from linear to circular polarization and back again. And all of the different parts of the, the, um, the, the far field hologram are sensitive to polarization independently of, of one another. Uh, we can do, there are many other examples we can do of this. We could make a continuous ring. Um, you could call it like a malice's law type of ring with, uh, where, where depending on where you are in the ring, you have a different effective polarizer in the far field 
Or if you illuminate with circular polarization, you get half the intensity of the max in each of these cases. Or we could do this over the extent of a complicated holographic image, where as you go from bottom to top in this image, it's sensitive to um, X, then Y, then 45 degree polarized light. Um, we could have done it for circular polarization as well. So uh, that shows that we can implement holograms that uh, can do arbitrarily complicated parallel polarization analysis. Uh, so we can make far hol holograms whose far fields have many polarizers. But what about uh, wave plates? What about polarization change, not just polarization analysis? So I'm going to give you another example of something we can do here. Imagine designing a holographic far field where in the far field, we just have a disk of light. Light is, is diffracted into a, a solid disk in, in, in the far field except that the polarization response of that disk is such that as we go out from the center of it, uh, it experiences a wave plate transformation whose retardance increases from zero to pi or uh, 180 degrees. And as we go around the periphery of, of, the, uh, of, this, of this disk, it is as though it experiences a wave plate with an increasing fast axis orientation. So to explain this a little bit more, this would be a far field hologram that within it contains all possible polarization state transformations. And uh, uh, not, I'm sorry, not all possible polarization state transformations, all possible linear wave plates. All wave plates that you would use in the lab are, are correspond to a point within this hologram. For instance, the perimeter of the hologram, uh, which is all wave plates with a retardance of 180 degrees, um, uh, are, are all half wave plates are on this perimeter. This red dotted line would correspond to all quarter wave plates. And this rather arbitrarily selected blue dot would be a one third wave plate with a fast axis orientation oriented at 45 degrees. And this would be the mathematical expression for this far field hologram. Um, and we can make this. So if you were to illuminate this with polarized light, what you would see in the far field would just be a uniform disk. The laser light goes into a uniform disk. But it would, be, it would be varying in polarization because every point would have corresponded to a different wave plate. Uh, and so if we, put, uh, if we vary not only the incident polarization state, but also the analyzer through which this is sent, we get a rich zoology of, of different patterns corresponding to uh, the, the spatially varying polarization produced here. Uh, but we can analyze all of these images in parallel to figure out what the experimentally observed Mueller matrix is at each point in the far field. And moreover, once we have that Mueller matrix, we can do what's known as the Lou Chipman decomposition in order to figure out what the orientation of the fast axis is and what the retardance is for each point in the far field. Um, and we can see that this actually uh, implements exactly what we wanted, which is a retarder with a variable fast axis orientation and a retardance that increases from zero to pi as you go out from the center. Uh, in, the met, in the experimental uh, implementation, we blocked the center because there is zero order light that would have corrupted the measurement. Um, so this is about all I have to say today. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit short of an hour, but I, I'm not going to keep you at 9 p.m. on a Friday night. Um, this, this Jones matrix holography, I think, generalizes a wide body uh, of past work on polarization sensitive metasurfaces, but also uh, polarization sensitive diffractive optics and holography in general. It shows that we have a very, uh, a, a very powerful ability to engineer the polarization dependence of the far field, or if this were placed in a larger optical system that included other elements, the polarization dependent point spread function in general of an optical system. Um, of course, there would be challenges to, to implementing that in real optical systems, but it is an exciting possibility. Uh, I would point you to our, our recent manuscript from August uh, on that subject. And um, more generally, metasurfaces, I think, are an exciting new tool for polarization optics. Um, and I hope that they enable some interesting applications and uh, new directions in the optics research community and maybe even industry. Uh, so I put my email here because anyone is welcome to email me with any ideas or questions. I would really look forward to hearing from you. And I promise I, 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 would, I would enjoy having an email conversation with anyone. Um, so uh, uh, I also would ask you to look out for an upcoming review article that we have on this subject. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, the review article should be out in about a month or two. Uh, and I want to acknowledge 
uh, some of my colleagues who have played a pivotal role in this work and our, our, our sponsors from the, uh, at Harvard and the US federal government. So thank you. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Nirmal Ghos has a question. Uh, he raised his hand, so please. Oh yeah, I forgot that people can raise their hands. Um, can anyone else raise their hand? Hi, uh, Noah. Thank you for a very nice talk on correlation meter service. I just Thank have you. A question. I just have a question regarding where you are using this uh, phase retrieval using Fourier domain zones, where you use polar decomposition to separate the unitary and the Hermitian part. So basically, we know that in this kind of situation, uh, the ambiguity comes to the order, the unitary and the Hermitian part. Does it lead to any kind of error in phase retrieval? So uh, the phase retrieval was implemented with this ordering of the Hermitian and unitary part. Of course, the, the other one is equally valid, but you're correct. You would get a different result. Um, I, think, I, I think it would work the other way around. I, I don't think I've tried. Um, uh, I, is that your question? I want to make sure I'm not answering yeah, yeah, the wrong question. Yeah, so that is the question, most precisely the question is that we all know that uh, when we try to retrieve polarization parameters, particularly from systems where you have many parameters, uh, many polarization parameters exhibit simultaneously, then there is always a potential ambiguity with respect to the order when you use the polar decomposition, like in the unitary yeah. and the Hermitian part. So my yes. question is that does it, does it lead to error in the phase retrieval? Uh, you may, so, okay, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so it definitely works for the way that I, uh, I coded it. Um, if you were to reverse the order, I, I haven't tried it. Maybe I will because it's a very quick check. I believe that it would still work and it may even converge to the same solution because in this uh, phase retrieval scheme, before you get to the design of the metasurface, which has to be unitary, you're discarding the Hermitian part. So you're, you're setting it to the identity matrix. So even though if you change the ordering of them, the ordering of the multiplication, even though the the maybe maybe the uh, certain yeah, steps because, of um, because this uh, matrix multiplication of different effects they are not commutative. No, so you may uh, end up in a different output when you multiply them in different orders. Yes, so but I, the... I just uh, uh, on in continuation to that uh, I was thinking because uh, typically there is this analogous differential Jones algebra, so that is where uh, nowadays people have been using for systems where you have such problem because uh, the differential Jones uh, matrix would also satisfy this Fourier relationship like the standard Jones matrix. So whether... Yes, the solution... Yeah. Yeah, so it, something to know is that the solutions to this are not unique because ultimately this is an optimization problem. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to implement some desired far field Jones matrix behavior with a Jones matrix has to be constrained in some way and it's definitely not the exact solution. So really, uh, 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 an alternative to this gershberg saxon algorithm would have been a brute force optimization of all of the parameters of the Jones matrix on the entire hologram. And uh, that, that might work on a powerful enough computer with the GPU. Um, but even then, the solution would not be unique. Really what yeah, so that, yeah, is but doing... Just, but the advantage of differential Jones is that you can include all the effects simultaneously into a same matrix rather than the order here because in a polar decomposition you have a order yes, of the yes. unitary and the Hermitian part. You're, you're talking about like the Jones n matrices, right? So that is a differential Jones, right? So you write a differential equation of the Jones matrix. So that uh, coefficient matrix, that is also, that is a differential matrix, but they should also satisfy the Fourier relation. Like you write yes. the dj dx, that means uh, the propagating part, the direction is let's say x is equal to some yeah. m into x. So m is that differential zone. So basically, if you take uh, a logarithm of uh, of the Jones matrix, you will get the differential matrix. Yeah, yeah, you're so talking about the, the, the exponentials. The matrix, yeah, uh, yeah Ex exponential exponentials, matrix. right? Like the exponential, matrix. yeah, matrix yeah, so, exponential. 
Yeah, so the advantage is that now you can write this Hermitian and the unit, unitary part simultaneously in that exponential matrix. Yes, um, that's in, that's an interesting take. Um, that that could also work. Uh, I hadn't considered doing it that way, uh, but it that that is also valid. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the day, though, um, it's an optimization problem, and there are multiple routes to getting a local minimum, and that may also work. Uh, but that's a very interesting suggestion uh, to think of it in terms of uh, differential Jones matrices. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. So, anyone has any questions, please? So, one small question that I have is, uh, so you design your meta surface using this GS algorithm, right? Yes, yes. So, do you try to simulate this as well or you just use this meaning GS algorithm as your, uh, you know, so, final product? So, it, and, yeah. a, a very important point here is that everything I've said, uh, uh, th this whole Jones matrix formalism, as well as most of what people are doing with meta services, is in the paraxial limit. It has to be. In fact, in order to use plane wave polarization states, um, we, we have to be uh, assume a single k vector, which is only true at small angles. Um, so uh, the, the assumption that is buried in what I'm showing here using this GS algorithm is that each of these pillar elements uh, will, will behave similarly to if you only had uh, that pillar element, that there's no interaction between, between, sub, between adjacent elements, which is a different way of stating the small angle limit, because at the small angle limit, there's no, you know, no coupling between adjacent elements. So uh, the way that this is done is that uh, we have a library of the behavior of each of these elements, and then when we run this algorithm, and end up with a final mathematical numerical form of the Jones matrix, we simply convert it into a design by sampling from the library. But that is wrong. Um, it, it, it's an approximation. It, it's a paraxial approximation. To do it better, uh, ultimately, you would have to work at the level of Maxwell's equations, which is what you're saying. You know, you would have to, you would have to, you, rather than, this is a, this is an abbreviated form of the most general way that you would approach this problem, which is to say, I want this behavior in the far field. Let me use full wave simulations to design a structure from scratch that will do that. Um, uh, that would be the most general statement. And that's what people call inverse design in photonics oftentimes. You know, goal first optimization, where you make no approximations. Uh, but here, we're looking at a very particular form where a, a specific set of approximations that work well have been made in order to create a simpler design protocol where we never have to deal with Maxwell's equations or simulations. Yeah, or only once, really. Okay. And how Does good is this question? approximation? Have you ever tried to compare or something? Well, it it's hard to answer that question because to simulate one of these, this, is, this has uh, millions of these pillars. Um, mm -hmm. Really computationally tractable. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Subham, Subham, Subham Chandel. Yeah. Hi, I have a very, very naive question, maybe. And the starting itself, you mentioned when you were telling about these uh, holographic uh, matter surface, you were mentioning that it's uh, you make it up of uh, dielectric. Why not anything else? Again, like not only dielectric. Uh, it, it, well, first of all, there's a, there's a few answers to that, some more fundamental than others. Number one, uh, this dielectric platform, it just it works very nicely and is very easy to fabricate. Uh, that's maybe the less fundamental answer. The, the more fundamental answer is that uh, it's nice to work with ideally lossless optical materials. But everything I said, like you said, uh, could have equally well applied to metallic structures. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, mixed even mixed metallic dielectric structures. Yeah. What I've what I've given you here is a is a uh, conceptual framework, and I've shown it with a very specific type of implementation. But that type of implementation is not fundamental. Sure. Yeah. One more thing. I'm like uh, most of it. Uh, like for example, in this current slide itself, it's operating at five thirty two nanometer. What will it take to make it for the broadband? I'm like. What approach you will have to 
make it so that it can work for the whole, uh, you know, like a band of 200, 300 nanometers, for example, in the visible domain. That's uh, that's challenging, and I think it would be extremely challenging for something as general as these holograms, because the thing is, I mean, uh, uh, ultimately the 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 elements are spaced at some separation. Yeah. Uh, as you change the wavelength, that spacing is not changing, but not the changing. wavelength is. So you know the hologram is going to disperse with wavelengths. I mean, there, there's there's two there's multi there's multiple different types of achromaticity here. The most strict one would be the light goes to the same place and does the same over a very wide wavelength band. I feel like that is very difficult. Another one would be. Uh, the light diffracts out, maybe out at different angles, but it maintains its function even as it's dispersing in an angle. That you might be able to address with some more type inverse design techniques to make more complicated structures that have some type of dis desired dispersion, uh, but it would still be challenging. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get it, I get it, yeah. And similarly, yeah. like uh, what challenges you see in the similar case for a wave plate rather than, you know, the hologram? For example, you have to do a whole wave plate that goes uh, uh, for a very long wavelength. Like here, I, I see the issues, but what for the quarter wave plate? For example, wave plate. Yeah. Uh, are, so wait, are you talking about anything I showed, or are you just talking about wave plates in general? Uh, a meta surface wave plate, yeah, in general, yeah. Oh well, yes, a, a meta surface wave plate would just be one of these where all of these are the same structure. Um, it would, or w when you say wave plate, do you mean one of these holograms? Uh, no, uh, the wave plates, I think somewhere in the slide, I think it was around 27, 38, or somewhere. I was mentioning what the, one of the applications of it. To me, yo, by, by embedding all wave plates. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah. Um, like, uh, how would that be made broadband? Yeah. Uh, it would be very challenging. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it would be difficult. It, it depends what you mean by broadband again. Like, do does it go into exactly the same angle and do exactly the same thing, or is it dispersing an angle but maintaining its function. Um, you know, okay, I, I meant in the sense, for example, if you have to replace the whole, you know, for example, this conventional uh, polarimeters that you were showing in the last part of it, if you have to replace the whole thing with a metal surface, you know, you need to have something, you know, for example, in conventional fashion, you have the uh, optical components or the, or example, polarization components that works for a broad wavelength range. But if you have to miniaturize the whole thing, you need to have these optical components on a you know, metal surface that can do the similar thing. So yeah. it's coming from there, I'm like, what are in the, the challenges that you see there? How to address any eh? some in in the grading in the grading case, um, you have to be content with having a rather narrow bandwidth um, because the, uh, the 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 orders will disperse from each other, uh, and and ultimately that will degrade your spatial resolution. Um, but if you can find a configuration of parameters where um, the spatial resolution is uh, degraded to an extent that you can tolerate and the bandwidth is not too narrow, then it might work. And I believe that those applications exist. Uh, but that is a fundamental, that is definitely a trade-off and it would be very hard to address. And uh, you're correct for pointing it out. Yeah, no, no, I simply wanted to have a one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So any other questions? I think there is no thank more you. Questions. Yeah. So if there is no more questions, let us thank uh, Noah for this um, very wonderful talk. Uh, thank you, Noah. We will. Uh, we are hoping to see you in our campus. Uh, yeah. When everything will be fine. Yeah. I I would love that. I I have never been to Asia anywhere, let alone India. But it would be amazing to visit. Yeah. Yeah. It will be our pleasure also. Yeah. I showed uh, Priyanuj around Massachusetts, so he owes me. Yes, yeah. yes. Piano, yeah, piano just slept, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, uh, thank you, everyone. It means a lot to me. I hope you have a good weekend. Yeah. Thank you, Noah. Yeah. Bye. Bye.